Thanks, everybody. Um, hey, if you have your Bible with you, uh, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 if you're not already there. Again, that's on page 917 if you're using one of those Bibles in the seats. And if you are using one of those Bibles in the seats and it's because you don't have a Bible of your own, uh, we have a Bible for you and we'd love to give that to you. Um, so please stop by the welcome, the welcome desk before you leave today. Um, we've, got, we've got a few gifts for you. Um, and we want to just make you, make you feel welcome. We also want um, to find out any ways we can pray for you. And it is our great, great honor to be able to share the Word of God. And we've, got, we've just got a really nice copy of the Bible for you. Um, so please take us up on that. Um, for the next seven weeks, what we are going to be doing is we are going to, we are going to be in a sermon series called CORE. Um, and... Uh, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the core convictions that we have here at Christ Community Church. The core convictions about what it means to follow Jesus and who we are as a church. Now, I want to just make clear as we step into this, um, uh, th for th this week we're going to talk about the gospel. Next week we're going to talk about discipleship. And then the following five weeks we're going to talk about those core convictions. These aren't things that distinguish us or make us unique though. I think sometimes um, we in, in churches have, have a tendency to talk about it that way, and I want to avoid that if at all possible. Because they're really not. They're really not things that make us unique. They're things that make us Christians. They are things that are biblically true of all Christians, but we just want to emphasize where we are setting our focus. What we, th where, what we think God is telling us from the Bible about who we are and why we're here. We are here to, to glorify God and make fruitful disciples of Jesus Christ. So these are, what we're going to be talking about are these things that, that characterize a people who glorify God and make fruitful disciples of Jesus Christ. These are for all Christians. They are, they are for us. If you're new here, it'll tell you a little bit about where, like, where our heads are at and, and where we are at as a community. But if you're, if, you're, if you're not new here, it's just a reminder. This is our focus. That's who we are. So as we dive in, um, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would, you would strengthen us, that you would, you would open our ears, open our eyes, that you would give us hearts that would understand. Lord, we, we don't want to walk out of here with hard hearts. We want to walk out of here full of your gospel, full of the good news, and we ask that you would fill us with it. Thank you. Thank you we get, that we get to be together. Thank you that we get to talk about the gospel. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, there's a number of ways we could define the gospel, um, but and, and actually... And we're going we're gonna to talk about how we define it here, and, if, and you can just read along with it. But um, as I was listening in to Pastor Matt, um, who, who preaches at the church Fort Wayne, who meets here before us, as I was listening to him last week, he made a really good point that, that the, he's preaching out of the Gospel of Mark, and, it, and, it, and the Gospel of Mark starts with, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then a few verses later, when Jesus starts his ministry, it says that he, he went around proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. He was already proclaiming the gospel before he died, before he was raised. It's the, the, the good news of the kingdom is, is told throughout the story of the Bible. Starting from Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve fell away, it is, it is God's plan to, to redeem a people for, his, for himself out of exile, out of exile from him. We've talked about that as we've gone through the book of Exodus. That's, that's the point of the book of Exodus. It's God's great big starting point um, or great big splash of salvation and, and redeeming a people out of exile for himself. The gospel pervades the scriptures. But, but we would never be able to, to talk about the gospel without, without saying this, these specific things. Okay, The gospel is the good news that, that God saves sinners. Through the coming of Jesus, through his perfect obedience through his suffering and death in our place, through his rising from the dead and his reign at the right hand of the Father through the Holy Spirit. 
encompassing the work of Jesus who took on flesh and now is at the right hand of the Father. And we would, we would not be able to talk about the gospel without also saying this. Through this Jesus, God is saving a people for himself. All who believe, with no distinction of who you are, what you've done, or where you're from. Now, I see a lot of people writing notes. That's, that's fine. If you didn't get it all, it's actually on our website under our mission and core values. So you're welcome to go and get that. But that's how we're, how we're defining it. God is saving a people for himself. All who believe in that, that word all, that, that word all is, is, is really a tricky one. It means all. All who believe with no distinction of who you are, what you've done, or where you're from. It, but this gospel, the tough, the tough part about this gospel is that it requires that you accept from God's hand everything that is required for life and salvation. So I do want you, if you take notes, I want you to write this down. If you don't take notes, that's fine. Don't worry about taking notes. Um, but I do want you to write this down. God has given us everything in Christ. It is a gift. I'm going to talk about that today. And God wants everybody to know it. God has given us everything in Christ. All that he has given in Christ is a gift and he wants everyone to know it. See, in, in Ephesians, we're starting in Ephesians 2, and I know that we haven't been, I haven't been preaching through Ephesians. And if, and if you've ever read Ephesians 1, you'll get just overrun by Paul, by the way Paul writes. And I'm seeing a few smiles because I'm, I'm going to meet with a group later this afternoon that, that has been do, trying to do just that in Ephesians 1. See, the gospel of Jesus was God's love-saturated plan before time began when he knew our names and he determined to, Paul says, lavish us. And yes, I do mean particularly us and all who believe. He, he determined to lavish us with the riches of his mercy and grace and his immeasurable love in Jesus. He planned to adopt us. Yes, if you are in Christ today, you, before, t- before the foundation of the world. He makes, uh, to make us his children and heirs through Jesus, his, who is his true son. His, Jesus is the heir of the Father. And through this Jesus, he is making us his heirs. He did it all on purpose. He did none of it is by accident. If you read Ephesians 1, if you read the book of Ephesians, you will hear, you, you will hear words like God chose, God predestined, God's will, God's plan, God's purpose. Over and over and over again. He did it all on purpose. None of this was by accident. So as Paul is wrapping up Ephesians 1, he's saying, he, he, he says, I, I see that that has become a reality in your lives, Ephesians. And so he says, I pray, when I think about these things, I pray for you. I pray that you would grow, that the Holy Spirit would give to you more fully to know the hope of God's calling, the riches of his inheritance, and his immeasurable power that he's poured on us who believe. It's it, that same power by which he raised Jesus from the dead and he seated him at his right hand. It's that same power that has now been poured out on you. He did it all on purpose. None of it was by accident. And that brings us to chapter 2. And if you're already a little bit overwhelmed with this, I think, I think we are meant to be. You know, actually much of, I, you probably have heard this if you've listened to sermons on Ephesians before, but much of Ephesians 1 is actually one sentence. Meant to overwhelm you like tidal waves over and over and over again. But here's the deal. God, as we step into Ephesians 2, God didn't do these things generally. He did them specifically. 
He did them specifically for you. He did them in the course of our lives. The one who knew this, who planned this, before the foundation of the world worked all things so that you could be here and you could hear his word and you could respond to it. That's the kind of God, that's the kind of wisdom we are talking about that God has. And and he worked all that together, but it's not just in general. It's not just a thing that happened in the past that we kind of like... Just, that just happens in, the, in moments in our lives. God steps in, in time. Paul says we were all dead in our trespasses, in our sins. All of us. And at the end of verse 3, if you notice, if you still got your Bible open, you should have your Bible open. We're going to be walking through this this morning. At the end of verse 3, he says that we were all, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We were all in the same place. We, no, what that means is nobody, nowhere, popped out of their mother's womb right with God. We all need to be brought from death to life. And, and if you're sitting there thinking this morning, you know what? I actually, as far as I remember, I, I believed in Jesus. I don't remember a, a day or time. That's okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I actually, that's actually my story. I don't, I don't know the day, a day or time. I know that I've passed from death to life. I know that I've passed from death to life. We all need to be brought from death to life. Our sin problem is a whole life problem. It is, it it, it corrupts every part of our lives, every part of our thinking. By nature and by choice, we have walked disobediently before God, doing what was right in our own eyes. And by doing that, Paul says, Paul says what was really happening, the reality behind that is that we were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I know that sounds weird, but Paul, if you read through Ephesians, he talks about the, the spiritual reality in the heavenly places. And for Paul, and I know that we live in a materialist world, and, and we don't think that anything beyond what we see and what we touch is real, Paul actually sees it the opposite. The spiritual reality in the heavenly places is reality. It's substantive. Not going, by going our own way, we were really serving a different king. We were serving a different kingdom. We brought nothing to the table except for our deadness and our sin. And I want you to take a moment to consider that. Not to beat you down. Okay, this is, none of this is to beat you down. Actually, this, this is, this is the, the half of the coin that teaches us why the good news is so good. For some of us, it's easy to think that, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two things that sound like they're, they're opposite things, but I would guess that in some way, shape, or form, these both exist in all of our lives, okay? First one is this, that we look around and we think that we are better than other people. It's easy. As though our sins don't amount to their sin. That is a lie. You're believing a lie if you believe that. To whatever extent you believe that, that is a lie. But some, on the other hand, are looking around this morning and thinking, I'm not as good as that person. That person seems to have their life put together. That must be what a Christian is. I'm not a good Christian. I'm not, I'm not as good a person as that person. That, too, is a lie. In both cases, you are believing that God finds you or someone else more acceptable because of works, because of something you've done or they've done, not because of what Jesus has done. You're placing your hope in the wrong thing at that moment, and I know that that is a battle for each of us. In some way, shape, or form. We cannot settle for the belief that something needs to be added to what Jesus has done in order for us to be accepted before God. We cannot do that. We must fight it at every turn. Every hint of it needs to be stomped out of our lives. It needs to be because we will, we will begin, we will, we will oh so subtly, 
oh so subtly, we will begin to disbelieve God and we will begin to hold ourselves higher than others. Or we'll, be, we'll begin to hold each other at an arm's length because I don't like how I feel when I, don't, I, when I feel like I'm not as good a person as what you are. The way through that is God's grace. Paul says in verses 4, but God... Verses 4 and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when, we were, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now Paul, if you read Paul, sometimes you'll notice it's, it's kind of hard to keep up because he seems to dive into what, to like be going this way and then dive into another place before he comes back. And it's sometimes hard to track. He inserts that phrase, by grace you have been saved. But I want, to, I want you to, to, to notice, to see that in verse 5, he's, what he says is this, there's this conflict, there's this contrast. We were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. He's pointing out that by grace you have been saved right here. It's for the simple fact of this. A dead person can't make themselves alive. That's impossible. There's nothing they can do to help their health because their health is gone. It takes an act of someone else. It takes an act of God to bring the dead to life. And that's what makes the good news so incredibly good. The love, I, 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 would, I, I want us to also kind of check in our minds and in our hearts this idea that, that, that the Father in heaven somehow is dissatisfied with you. Now, God has done all these things um, because we are sinners, right? He's, he's meeting us where we're at in Jesus. But Somehow we, we, get, we let this, this thought come in that God is, 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 the Father is full of anger and it's not until Jesus comes and talks him out of it that we get that, that, the God, that God isn't angry anymore or he sets it aside kind of unwillingly like Jesus pries it out of him. Don't ever let your, your understanding of God drift to that point. All that God does is saturated saturated and I use that word very much on purpose because because of the way that Paul comes at this it's saturated by his love his mercy and his grace for us in Jesus and that is because God is love he isn't love most of the time he isn't loving most of the time he is love there is nothing that God does that is not is not characterized by his love. Listen, I want you to listen just to the ways, again, that, that God is described in these 10 verses. This is why I use the word saturated. And by saturated, I mean something that like is like full to overflowing. Every pore, every, every, every part of the space is full of God's love. That's how God is. God has described in these 10 verses that he is rich in mercy, rich, wealthy, overflowing. He's got, he is capped in money bags when it comes to mercy. It says, it says God being, ri being rich in mercy, that is a statement of who he is. And because of the greatness, the immeasurable greatness of his love that he has for us in Jesus Christ, because of that great love. And, and, and the, a little bit, a couple verses later, it says that his whole purpose was to, to show the immeasurable riches of his grace. Captain Moneybags about his grace too. He has no end, there is no end to his wealth of mercy and grace. There is no, there is no part of God that is not full of, love, of steadfast love. Grace. Let's talk about grace. Because we, I don't, that's a bible -y word that we use. And, and, and we talk about this from time to time. But I want to remind you, and I don't want to tire of reminding you, that grace is, we have this conception that grace is a, is a 
big pile of something that God uses a little more here, a little less here. God, give me some grace. What God, grace though isn't that. Grace is, what grace is, is the unearned favor of God on sinners. It is God's disposition. It is God's, it's the way that God looks at you and how God feels about you is grace. It has a lot more to do with who God is than what God has. Grace, he is full of grace. He is rich with grace. Rich, rich, I mean, think about that. He is rich with with favor upon sinners. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, so even though we disobeyed, even though we rebelled, even though we rejected God, we made ourselves his enemy. The Bible's very clear on that. We have made ourselves God's enemy. And we've served, and Paul just said a few verses ago, that we have served the kingdom of Satan. We didn't realize that. We didn't think about that. But that is what we were doing when we were going our own way. We were playing right into Satan's hands. At that, even while he did that, God gave us to Jesus and gave Jesus to us. He united us to Jesus. He made us with Jesus. At a moment in our lives, whether you remember it or not, he made us alive, he raised us up, and he seated us with Jesus in the heavenly places. In chapter 1, when he, when he seated, when he raised Jesus up, when Paul talks about him raising Jesus up and seating him at the right hand of, of the Father, he, that is an example of God, that is the example of God's immeasurable, infinite power. And Paul is saying, it's that power that brought you from death to life. Whatever the Father does in Jesus, he does in us together with Jesus. Where Jesus is, so are we. He made us alive. He he raised us up from the dead. And he has seated us in the heavenly places with Jesus. And look at verse 7. He did all this so that he could show his immeasurable grace. Uh, His immeasurable grace, which takes a very specific form. It takes the form of the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His grace takes a form. It is is his favor. It's not a big pile of something, but it takes a specific form. God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That is... pervades everything that he does. Everything is set on this foundation of God's grace. And this grace can only be received by faith. And let me tell you why. It is a gift. A gift. Everything we have, everything God has done for us in Jesus is a gift. It's all gift. It's not a result of works It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can contribute to. It is a gift, and and a gift is something that you don't get credit for. You didn't get it because you were so great. You gave it because the giver was. So what is faith then? Faith is... I'm going, to, I'm going to use a bit of a different definition than I've, I've used before. Faith is, is, a per, is a persuasion of my heart that Jesus is mine and I am his. My heart is persuaded that he is mine and I am his. I have life and salvation in him alone. It amounts to this. All that God has done for the redemption of all of humankind, all who believe, He has done for me. That power, that immeasurable power by which he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand, he he has done in me. Faith is specific. Leave that up there, please. Faith is specific. It can only exist if you're convinced that you believe it's true. That might sound like kind of a weird thing to say, but think about it. Because we think of faith as wishful thinking. We, we use faith very loosely. Like, you just got to have faith. I, I listen to too many 80s songs in my wife's car, so I'm thinking of a Wham song, right? Yeah, yeah. 
You just got to have faith. Wishful thinking. No, no, no. Faith takes on a specificity. It can only exist if you're convinced that it's true, that what you believe in is true. If you don't think it's true, you're not going to believe it because faith is trust. You can't trust in something you think is a lie. Faith is the only way that we can receive the gift of Jesus because anything that we would add on top of it, any work, any, any righteousness, anything that we would add to what Jesus has done would suggest that what Jesus has done isn't sufficient. That it doesn't actually do the job. That's why faith is that's why faith is, is so critical, and it can only be by faith. This is why I talk when, sometimes when we come to the table, I say, come with nothing in your hands. Empty your hands of all your stuff, all, your, all the ways you're trying to make yourself right, all the ways you're trying to look, look right before God and before other people, all the ways that you're trying to, to fix the things that you've broken, only to find that you keep breaking them worse. This is what I mean by running to Jesus. Faith. Let your heart be persuaded that Jesus is yours and you are his. There's a, I saw a Facebook post yesterday. I don't know why I was looking at Facebook, but I was looking at Facebook and I saw a Facebook post of someone that I, that I care about actually and um, and um, he was saying, like, I want to declare before everybody that, like, that, that Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is, is my Redeemer. You know, it was one of those posts. And then at the very end it said, I'm going to try harder to live for him. And I thought, man, man, you get it. Like, you... You see the truth, but you're, but you're not letting it carry through. That's not what grace is. Grace isn't about you trying harder. Look, effort, it's not that the Christian life doesn't involve effort. It involves a lot of effort. Faith does involve effort, but it is not you, it's not about you working harder. It's about you believing that Jesus has done everything that you need. When you come to rest, when, like, Maybe maybe this will maybe this will be easy for you to like a, an easy parallel because it is for me at least. Um, when you want to take a day and rest, it takes a lot of effort to rest, doesn't it? It takes a lot of effort to stop and to rest. But when you're resting, you're not doing anything; you're just resting. Like that's it. So that's how, I, I think that's, how, that's a good example of how we can put, pour in a lot of effort and yet not be earning, not be doing something necessarily. We think of works rightly in our world as things we do to earn something. That's what works are. And that'll be up here on the screen. In verse 9, Paul says that not... As a, he says, by grace you have been saved, in verse 8, through faith. It is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. A gift cannot be earned. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God does this so that no one else gets the credit. We think of, thing, of works as things we do that earn something, rightly. I think the Bible reflects, reflects that that's what works are. But that's our view of works. God's view of works is actually a bit different. We, we hear God's view of works in verse 10. For we, we are his workmanship. We are, an act, we are an act of God. We are his workmanship. <laughs> Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Thanks, Paul. Like, if that's not confusing, it's not a result of works, but we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's view of works is different than ours. 
Not only does, is, is, does he prepare works for us by which we're not earning his acceptance, we're doing them because we're accepted. We are given, we are in Christ, we are made alive, we are freed up, and we are empowered and given authority to do good works. They are opportunities that God has given us to, to show off his goodness in this world. We do those not because, not, not to gain his acceptance, but out of, the sheer, out of the sheer joy of finding ourselves accepted. There, it's showing off who God is. He's given us everything in Jesus. It's a gift, and he wants everything, everyone to know about it. And so he pr- has prepared good works for his people beforehand. Do you... Christian, receive those things as gifts. Receive those, those opportunities as gifts from God. I had an opportunity to do that this week uh, on, on one, one particular day that, that stood out to me. And it was, it was a source of joy for me all, all day. It was an interruption. It wasn't something I wanted to do. But it was an opportunity that God put in my life so that I could express how good he is. If someone were to ask you, how do you know you're a Christian, how would you answer it? How would you answer that? Would you say I'm a Christian because I live like a Christian? Well, what does that mean? Do you, do you really think that the standard you've set up measures up to God's standard? Or, or would you say that I know I'm a Christian because I feel God working in my life? When, but when being a Christian is primarily about how you feel about God or how you can sense his working, what happens when you can't sense that? And when you don't feel anything or you feel the opposite, are you not a Christian anymore? Would you say you're a Christian because at some point in your life you prayed a prayer to receive him? To receive Jesus? Now look, all these things are, are parts of the Christian life. They're good but they cannot bear the weight of the question, how do you know that you are a Christian? When we start from ourselves, we, saw, we find all sorts of reasons to doubt, to, to think, to, to second guess. Is it really God that I'm feeling in my life or did I just have an extra cup of coffee? Did I really believe then? You know how many times I've, I've heard um, I've heard people get up and, and give testimonies and, and, and giving a testimony bef- uh, about their faith and saying, I, I received uh, the Lord as my Savior when I was five, but I didn't know this. I didn't understand this. I didn't live like this. I, was, I received this, but. There's so many ways that we, we second guess and that we, that we doubt when we put our things on our own shoulders. Was my faith real? Did I believe enough? Did I believe all the right things? Did I really understand my sin? It, all those sorts of things. The only answer that can bear the weight of how do you know you're a Christian is to start with what God has done. And I want you to remember this. Because God sent his son Jesus how do I know that, he, that I am a Christian? Because God sent his son Jesus, the one he loved most, to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I, when I see you, I cannot imagine that you are a worse sinner than I am. I've been taught by God and his word to think this way. Jesus lived the life that I could not and I would not live. And sometimes we make that out to be a means to an end. Like Jesus did this just so that we could, like one of the great things about, about, about the gospel is that we, we actually gain Jesus' righteousness when God makes us united with him and, and, um, and binds us to Jesus. He gives us Jesus' righteousness. But the, very, the fact is, is Jesus was obedient and Jesus was righteous and Jesus perfectly obeyed the Father because he loved the Father. And he knew the Father loved him. 
He died the death that I deserve. And being dead and in the grave, God rose him from the dead so that I might live. He was seated at the right hand of the Father. He is infinite in power and authority, and my life is hid with him. God's word tells me that this Jesus is God's gift to me. That is how God loves. That is how I know I am a Christian. Because of what he has done. Faith is the persuasion of my heart that Jesus is mine and I am his. All that God has done for the redemption of humankind, he has done for me. I believe that. That's how I know that I'm a Christian. God loved me this way. That's how I know. Now, let me tell you about the day that I believed. Now let me tell you about how it feels to have have Christ in my life. Let me tell you about God's power. Let me tell you about how he's changed me. Set on the foundation of what God has done. Whenever you doubt, whenever you don't, whenever you say have that question in your in your mind, how do I know? How do I know that this is enough? You go back to Jesus and you receive it in full. You receive the answer in full. The answer is outside of you in him. Everything in Jesus, all of it comes to you as a gift. And God wants everybody to know it. He wants you to know it. He wants me to know it. He wants everybody to know it. That's what he's doing. The gospel is good news for a reason. But it's hard news for us because we we cannot fathom we cannot fathom something that is purely a gift. It's grace that we don't understand. But as we go back to Jesus again and again and again, as we empty our hands, as we run back to him, as we come to his table, as we as we 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 rehearse again all that God has done in him, remember that now God has brought you, has done all that in you. Bound you to Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, you go. Whatever is true of Jesus is true of you. We exist to proclaim this news. Next week we're going to talk about what a disciple is and what, about what this kind of looks like as we, as we go day by day by day, moment by moment by moment, how we grow and things like that. But, but it all comes back to this. When you're a, a sports team never like gets beyond practicing the fundamentals, right? You don't, you don't just play full games. You practice. You practice shooting. You practice tackling you practice whatever i don't know sports yay we never get beyond the fundamental of the gospel it changes everything it'll continue to change everything and i'm so so glad that i get to talk about it with you week after week after week after week if you're ever tired of hearing about it just know that i know that at some point in the week you've forgotten it That's why we're going to talk about it again. God, let your gospel, let your, the beautiful, overwhelming saturation of your love and kindness that has come to us through Jesus, let it change us. Let it strengthen us. Let it... um, Let it overrun the sin of our hearts. Let let us understand that that we don't contribute anything to what Jesus has done, but now knowing that, knowing that we are washed clean, knowing that we are made alive again, that nothing can take away what we have. Nothing can take away our hope of a kingdom. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. Nothing in all of heaven or on earth. Because you have authority over it all, Jesus. God, help us remember that and be 
and empower us with your spirit to do your will, to take up those opportunities, those good works that you have prepared for us because you delight to prepare them for us and you delight to show off how good you are. Show off how good you are in us, in our lives, in our every moment. Show off how good you are when we leave here and five minutes later we, we forget the gospel altogether and we're fighting in the car. Show off how good you are in, our, in every breath that we take. Lord God, we need you for all of it. It's all a gift. Open up our hands so that we can receive it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As the worship team's coming up here, um, see how smoothly I did that? Yeah. Um, we are, as we prepare ourselves to come to, to the Lord's table this morning, I want us to, um, I say this often, but I just, I just, we just talked about it. Whatever, whatever you're carrying with you, whatever you're, if, if there's a point in your life where you're looking across to somebody else and either thinking, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but I am kind of better than that dude. Or, or, yeah, I hear you, but like my life is just one catastrophe upon another catastrophe, one trauma after another. Hear me. Empty your hands. You don't need anything but Jesus. And the only, the, the, the call to come to this table is to come bearing nothing because Jesus has borne it all for you. This is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. We come re remembering that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law because he loved the Father to the uttermost. He perfectly fulfilled God's law, and because he did, we are accepted, and we can never be forsaken. And we come to be with Jesus. We come to commune with the same Jesus who promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is the bread that nourishes us. We eat bread and we drink because we need to be fed. We need nourishment. Jesus is that bread. Jesus is the cup in whom, is, is the vine in whom we have to abide if we're going to bear fruit. And as we come, we, we come united in, in, the, in, in the spirit, made one. That's actually the next part of Ephesians 2, how God has made us all one in Christ Jesus. Broken down every, every wall, reconciled us to God and reconciled us to each other. And so we can come in Christ's love and in our affection for one another. And this, this is a feast of hope because as surely as, as you taste the bread and drink the cup, Jesus will come. We will be made like he is. Our prayers turn to praise. Our faith turn to sight. Not just persuaded in our hearts, but see wrapping our arms around it. That's what this table proclaims to us. It's the Lord's table. All who believe are welcome to it. If you are not, if you, if you are not a Christian, if, if, um, if you, you hear what I'm saying about the gospel, about it being a gift, and you're not ready to lay down yourself, then, yeah, you're not a Christian. We're glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're here. We want you, we want you back. But this meal isn't for you yet because it would be a lie, and we're not asking you to lie. All you have to do is drop what's in your hands and believe that Jesus actually is what God says he is. He's done what he says he's done. And you are welcome at this table. So if that's not you, just, just pray. Just pray that God would reveal himself. The way we do this is um, come, to the, come to the middle and come around the edges, and uh, the, the elders will, will serve you up here. Um, and we will, uh, and as you get the, the bread and the juice, come back to your seats, and we will, uh, we will receive those things together. There is gluten-free bread in those little white cups. If you need gluten-free, it's been kept separate from the rest. Um, so uh, please partake of that if you need it. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, our Lord took bread. 
And having given thanks, he, he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on the same night, our Lord took the cup after they had eaten and he, he blessed the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. People of God, this is the Lord's table. You are welcome to come in faith and come when you're ready.